Hello, my fifth grade friends. My name is Miss Simmons, and I am super excited to be with you today. I am going to be teaching you a reading lesson on making inferences with nonfiction or informational text. Remember, nonfiction text, informational text, the same thing. They are text that is based on truth, based on facts, based on research, based on real life things. All right. So I'm going to share my screen with you and we're going to go ahead and get started. I am not going away. You should see me somewhere on the side of your screen. So let's get started. Do you know how to read like a detective? That's just some suspense music because when I think about a detective, I think about someone who has to really be smart and think and use clues to solve a case. So it's kind of suspenseful because it's almost like a mystery, right? So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna use text clues in order to answer questions. So you guys have been talking about write there questions and think and search questions and questions that may not be in the text, but you might have to infer. So we're gonna work with that today with nonfiction text. I want you to take a look at this picture. Yeah, pretty cool, right? Yeah, very interesting. So what, does, what information or what evidence does this picture give us? Well, right now, I can see that it looks like it's been an accident. Do you see that? Yeah, it looks like it's been an accident. And um, looking, the reason why I know it's been an accident is because the car is no longer able to move. It's crashed. The back window is up. Looks like glass is everywhere. And there's an animal stuck in the back. So something has happened. So what do we already know when we see something like this in real life? Well, we can see that um, that animal is probably no longer living. It looks like it's pretty much dead. And I can tell it probably is an accident that has happened because the fire, looks like this is a firefighter or an emergency rescue person has come to actually maybe help maybe the person that was in the car get out or so forth. Um, and we know that emergency people come when there is an accident. So I basically can guess that maybe somehow this animal that might be a deer or a moose got into an accident with this car and the animal is dead. I see that, I see the evidence in the text and I have made that guess, right? So the only thing I really just did was make an inference. You guys have been making inferences since kindergarten. You've been making inferences all your life. So I'm gonna break that down in just a second on what that really is, just in case you forgot. So our I can statement today is, I can read like a detective by using evidence from informational text in order to find answers that require an inference. It looks like we're doing a lot today, but we're not, guys. We're continuing to read like a detective using clues as we read from the text. We're continuing to prove our, um, our thoughts through using the evidence in the text. We are going to be reading informational text today, which means we're reading text that is based on truth. Why are we doing all this? Because there are gonna be questions that sometimes you have to answer as a reader, and you're going to need to know how to make an inference to answer those questions. And we're gonna keep plugging on through. All right, so do you remember how to infer? Hmm. Well, when you infer or make an inference, an inference is the same thing as infer, okay? I want you to know that those two words are just alike. So when you infer or make an inference, you use what the text said or the pictures that you see in the text and what you already know. I'm going to say that again. When you infer or make an inference, you use what the text says or maybe the pictures in the text plus or and what you already know to make an inference. Let's look at a video to learn a little bit more about making an inference.
Uh oh, boys and girls, looks like my video has stopped. Let's see, it looks like it's maybe buffering. Let's try it again. My knees were shaking. There we go. And my heart was pounding in my chest. I took a deep breath. I pretended I wasn't alone. Great job, Moby. I really understood how nervous you were. Even though you didn't say you were nervous, I made an inference. What is an inference? When you infer, you use clues, add what you already know, to come up with an idea. Number four, it's thunder. Everyone's wearing rain boots and jackets and holding umbrellas. So I can make an inference that it's raining. I don't really know for sure that it's raining because I'm not outside, but the thunder and the rain here are clues, so I can be pretty sure it is raining. How can I make inferences when I read fiction? Let's see, in this book, of the tortoise and says she's really slow. Instead of pretending she reads like the tortoise, Moby talks about how great she is. During the race, Moby is so sure to win that she can keep the time for the book. The tortoise wins the race. The way characters act tell you about how they think or feel. Falls asleep during the race. Hey, the clues tell me that the hare is kind of stuck up and needs to win the race. The tortoise gets ready for the race, lures the hare, and runs as fast as she can. The clues tell me that the tortoise is really determined. Authors use clues and details so they don't have to write everything in exact words and figure out how the characters feel can be exciting. lay their eggs on land. One leatherback can lay over a hundred eggs. Hmm. I wonder why sea turtles lay so many eggs. You can use what you already know to make inferences. I know that seagulls like to eat baby turtles. Moby knows that the ocean has other what you observe to make inferences. Ew, I bet all that trash doesn't help the sea turtles. Maybe that's one reason why they're endangered. I guess making inferences is like being a detective. You look for clues and put them together with what you already know to come up with an idea. Okay, so in this video, you saw that they talked about what it was to make an inference. So she said, use what the text said or what the pictures um, show, plus what you already know, and you make your inference. And then she shared how to make an inference when you're reading fiction text and nonfiction text. And the biggest thing she said was, you want to always use, just like a detective, the clues that you see in the text, plus what you already know to make that inference. So here are some questions that you may see either on a test or that your teacher may ask you that will help you or that will show you that you are about to make an inference. Let's look at some of these questions. One question says, I can tell that, 
because, so we can say, I can tell that the mother sea turtle lays a lot of eggs because a lot of the babies will not survive, okay? So I just made an inference. I used what the text said, plus what I already know happens in nature. Let's look at another question. Based on the information in the text, the reader can infer that, or another question, which is usually used for um, pictures, are the author include a picture along with the text too. So you saw that they showed um, an image in the video of, sea tur of the mother sea turtle laying her eggs well, and laying a lot of eggs. So I know the author included that image in that video to show that she is laying a lot of eggs because we know that some of them may not survive. And then sometimes your text may just say, I can infer that. So I am going to actually continue and I'm gonna model and show you how to infer with text, the way you use the text clues plus what you already know. Remember that this is I do, so you should just be listening to me at this point. So I'm using, um, we have a text that I found on Epic that talks about the amazing things about the body. And I know you guys have been talking about zombies um, this in the last couple of days. So I thought I would pull something from the text and the text is all about all the crazy things that the human body can do. So this particular section was called vampire fangs. I thought that would fit nicely with the zombies that you guys have been talking about. So just listen as I read, and I'm also going to think through how I read as a reader too to help you, to help, that helps me. Vampire fangs. Candles flicker as a man in black sweeps down a winding staircase. Winding staircase. In my head, I know that a winding means to like a curve. So the staircase kind of is probably like bent. Most staircases, and when we say staircases, that's just steps, okay? So most steps you see just regular steps like that, but these steps have a curve to them, a winding staircase. So candles flicker as a man in black sweeps down a winding staircase, his full length cape flowing behind him. Mm, look at that picture clue. That helps me to see what this looks like. At the bottom, he grabs a beautiful young woman and bears his teeth. Bear means he kind of like, ha, shows his teeth. She faints, which means she's kind of like, ha, ah, she falls out. She faints as he prepares to drink her blood. Now we know that's not true. And I'm inferring right now that this is probably talking about a vampire, right? Yeah. The long canine teeth of the famous vampire Count Dracula are known around the world. They are sharp and strong like yours, only longer. So I know looking at this vampire here, I know vampires usually have those two teeth right here that are kind of long. So that's what I'm visualizing in my head when it says the long canine teeth. They are sharp and strong like yours, only longer. Look in the mirror to check yours out. They're the pointiest teeth you have. Sometimes these teeth are called fangs, even on people. But you're no vampire. So what are canine teeth doing in your mouth? So I wanted to put a little picture here to show you where the canine teeth actually are. So if you look at my image here, my illustration, we have here, look at the top. We have here like your two front teeth that sit in the front. And then you have two teeth beside those two front teeth. They're called incisors. But then right beside the incisors are your canines. And if I smile, I'm gonna get real close. You can kind of see these right here. Those are my canine teeth. You have them at the top and you have them at the bottom. So they're pretty much the longest teeth that kind of stick down or stick up at the bottom. Those are your canine teeth. So I just wanted to show you a picture so you will know what I'm talking about from the text, okay? Now, I see that we have a mystery question box here. So I'm going to see what the question says and I am going to see if I can actually answer it. So the question is, I can infer that the author included information about a vampire so that 
Well, I think the author included information about this vampire. When I look at my clues, he said the vampire um, has a long cape, but I don't really think that's why the author included information about the vampire. I think it has something to do with his teeth because I know vampires have those long teeth. And I just found out today that these teeth are called canine teeth. So that's why I think the author included information about the vampire because vampires have canine teeth and he wants us to focus on why we have these same type of teeth, except ours are not as long, right? All right, let's turn the page. So I'm not gonna read all of this text. I'm just gonna read this first part here, but I want you to see, I just used clues to answer the last question. I see we have another question box here. So I'm gonna keep reading and see if I can um, find some clues to possibly answer that question. Let's take a peek at what the question already is. So the question says, based on the information from the text, I can infer, and infer means use what the text said, plus what I already know, that one of the reasons humans and animals have canine teeth is because, so in my reading, I'm going to probably read about humans, well, and animals, and why we have canine teeth. So let's see. These four strong pointy teeth help you tear off chunks of solid foods, such as apples and steak. With deep roots, they're the longest, most stable teeth you have. Still, they're not nearly as long and stable as the canines of many other animals. Hmm, I see the word stable here twice. I wanna know if I can figure out what that word means. It says, with deep roots, they're the longest, most stable teeth you have. Still, they're not nearly as long and stable as the canines many other animal, many as the canines of many other animals. So I'm thinking stable here might mean long and maybe strong, like they don't go anywhere, they're always there. Because I know when my canines are pretty strong. I think that might be what stable means. Walruses, oop, there's a picture for walrus right there. Walruses, for instance, have upper canines called tusks that are close to a meter or three feet long. Yeah, look, I love that the author gave me this illustration here. Look how long these canines are. And they're called tusks. You know what? Elephants are another animal that have tusks, those long, oh, I guess elephants have canine teeth. Who knew, right? It says they're so strong, they can be used like steel picks. Steel means iron, very something very strong like iron. They're, they're so strong, they can be used like steel picks helping the walruses haul themselves from the sea up into the shore. So I am visualizing that like this walrus is laying here, you know, chilling, but before it was laying on top of the ice, it probably was in the water and it has to get up on top of that ice to kind of lay down and chill. So it used its tusk. It kind of like, um, I guess catapulted, or if you ever look at people when they're using like uh, sticks or, or stilts or canes to help them jump up somewhere and get somewhere. So he uses those tusks and kind of puts himself or flips himself on top of that ice. That's just what I'm imagining. So we have a lot of information packed up in this um, paragraph here. Our, tr our question here says, based on the information from the text, I can infer that one of the reasons humans and animals have canine teeth is because, well, the text said we have teeth because it helps us tear off chunks of solid food, such as apples and steaks. So that's for humans. And also for animals like the walrus, it said that they use them to um, actually get or uh, climb up on things. They kind of like maybe some extra arms. They use them to climb up on things. So that's one of the reasons that we have canine teeth and that walruses have canine teeth. So what I did was I used the information from the text plus what I already know about teeth. Teeth are strong. They help us chew food, bite tough food. Um, I know with the walrus, it helps them um, climb on top of things. They put those um, tusks there and they were able to climb up. So I used that plus what I already know to make an inference of why um, we have these canine teeth, okay? Easy peasy, right? Yeah. So in just a minute, we are going to work together and we're gonna read some more in the text to see if we can continue to read like a detective and make inferences. 
So I hope that for right now, you know how to make an inference. Remember when you make an inference, I'm gonna go back to my chart. You use what the text says or pictures from the text plus what you already know to make your inference. And you can do that with informational text or fiction text. Good to see you. And for those of you that are at school, I will be seeing you. I will be joining you in just a second and we're gonna do some more practicing. <laughs>